So I'm here in Alabama with you. It's always more fun when we get to record these things together, I think. It is. Yeah, yeah, I like it. And I like the air travel between Rapid City, South Dakota and Huntsville. It's not uh, that bad. No, it's not bad at all. I can leave my house. I left one hour before the flight because the airport's real close to my house and uh, made the flight comfortably with 20 minutes to spare of meandering around at the gate. So one hour from my house to in the air. And then from there, it's five hours to you pick me up. Dang. That's not bad. That's awesome, dude. It's it's ridiculous that we live in a time where that can happen. You know one of the best things about the Rapid City Airport? I would like to know. TSA. It's good? It's great because there's nobody there. It's an airport that everybody wants to fly into because it's super touristy. I mean, it's like the uh, Pigeon Forge of the western half of the United States. Very family oriented. A lot of mm-hmm. people come to Rapid City, the Black Hills, Mount Rushmore, Crazy Horse. You've been there. Mm-hmm. And so when you fly, there's just no line. I have the TSA pre-check, but it doesn't matter at all. There's no line for either ever. I've never waited to have my ID scanned. Really? Yeah, they just wave you through. I mean, they check the ID. They, they're responsible, but yeah. you don't have to wait. And with the TSA pre-check, I get to go to the don't have to take my shoes off side and everything you scan right through. I've never been stopped there in all my flying until I came to see you this time around. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I'm just imagining you getting a prostate exam. <laughs> I got stopped. Yeah, I got stopped. They flagged my bag. I have a bag with nothing in it. I mean, this microphone I'm talking into, I brought that. Yeah. And a pair of headphones, a couple changes of clothes because I can do laundry here at the house and uh, toiletries. That's it. Okay. Charger for my phone. That's literally everything I brought. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. No, thanks. I appreciate that. And my bag gets flagged for that. Okay. Come on. They know what a microphone and headphones look like. What's the problem? The guy's like, I got to pull you aside. Come on over here. Stand at this table. Like, dang, I'm at the in trouble table. What is going on? (laughs) And he won't touch my bag. His hands are like hovering over yeah, the bag. Yeah, they can't. Is that a rule? Usually they say, is there anything sharp in the bag that could injure me? Okay. He did ask that. Yep. Yep. I said, no, no, certainly not. But he still wasn't touching the bag. I could tell. I mean, it's a you know, probably dude in his 50s, a little bit of facial hair, glasses, bald on top, but the long hair a little bit. You know, that's what he looked like. Inconsequential, I guess. He's just standing there kind of hesitating i'm like this is a really odd check and i'd like to get in there like he knew something was in the bag and he was scared of it i mean he got flagged he's supposed to look through it it's like he was trying to find words he's like okay well here's the thing um our scans picked up something long in the bag that is vibrating and we prefer to have you turn that off what what are you talking about He's like, uh, can I open the bag? Yeah, of course. I mean, you're the TSA agent. Go for it. So he opens up the bag. I'm like, there's nothing even in there. What is this? And he points to my toiletry bag here. And I'm like, I got deodorant in there. Your what are we brush? even talking about? Nope. So here's the thing. I travel with these hair clippers. I have this USB chargeable hair clipper set. Okay. Because of male pattern baldness. I like to keep it all kind of even. Let you know? see that. It's a great set of clippers. Just go ahead and is that is that metal? Yeah, I guess. Tap that black button right there in the middle. Hold that up to the mic. Whoa! So that was happening in my bag, apparently, as it went through the scanner. Now, I can't even begin to speculate what the gentleman thought the item in my bag was. Okay. But he was very insistent. Normally, the instruction that I see is... You, He's like, I ain't touching that's that. That's exactly it, man. He's like, I don't know what is making this particular sound. But this time around, we're going to have you reach in there and turn off whatever is making the vibrating. Well, how did he know? So, okay. So I thought that the the scanners were just imagers. That's what I thought too. But he knew that there was motion there. Yeah. Maybe he felt it when he picked up the bag. I mean, I didn't feel it when I was wearing the backpack. But sure enough, I opened it up and that thing was in the on position just like that. Just buzzing and humming. That makes me think that there is a... Okay, well, first of all, do we think that the machine detected the vibration? I don't know. I mean, it was the most innocuous bag ever. And obviously, the quirk about it is that clearly there have been other things in people's bags over the course of his career that move in a similar way that made him uncomfortable. (laughs) 
and so he wasn't going to touch it, but I'm going, how the heck did that thing fire up anyway? Made me look stupid, hair clippers. Uh-huh. So I think I might just grow out like one of those like old man mullets where you just let the top go. Skull it? Yeah. And you just let the rest go. So that never happens to me. So I don't have that embarrassing situation at the TSA ever again. Did I ever tell you about my embarrassing situation at the, no. uh, it wasn't the TSA because it was in Peru. Oh. Yeah. So the <clears throat> PSA? <laughs> Whatever it was. I don't know. <laughs> Peru Security Administration. <laughs> so a long time ago, this was before I worked with Not Forgotten. Um, I was living in Coleman, mm-hmm. Alabama, between, he's halfway between Huntsville and Birmingham. And we were going to go down there. There, there was a, a missionary down there that was doing some work, and we wanted to go down and just like work with him, see what was up, you know, help him out. And he really wanted us to do like a traveling, not like a vacation Bible school, but he had been working in all these village villages. He and his wife, and he wanted us just to go and do like a little fun program for the kids or whatever. Yeah, sure. So we decided, okay, well, we we had these puppets, okay, and so we we're going to take these puppets and pull a curtain like we pull a string and we would put like a shower curtain kind of thing on it oh got it tied behind for the puppets yeah and yeah, so okay, we, we would kind of like kneel down and like stick the puppets up and like act like they were talking it was cute i really enjoyed it and so we had this one puppet that was like wanted to be an actress or whatever and she was all like flamboyant and had like this you doing this f- in spanish yeah 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 it was a script or are you just making stuff up basically we just played a little cassette tape oh okay back in right. the day and then we would just do what the you know we would it was simple okay like one of the puppets was a fireman and you know all these different things one of them was this like dancer and she was like wanted to be a movie star and she had a feather boa and all this stuff uh when it came time to come back to the states we put all the puppets in these bags and we split the bags up everybody got two bags coming back and so he goes, uh, so, sir, it was an American guy in Peru. He's like, okay, so we're getting everything ready for the flight home, and uh, we're going through all the stuff. Sir, I, I flagged your bag. I have to check your bag. He looks at me. He goes, sir, did you pack these bags? I said, yes, sir. So everything in this bag is yours. Yes, sir, it is. Okay. And so he flops it open, and it's a bag full of feather boas. <laughs> <laughs> he looks at me and goes, sir, are these your feather boas? I said, yes, sir, they yes, are. Sir, they are. <laughs> they are my feather boas. Very well, sir. <laughs> just having a good day. <laughs> they started calling me Destiny after that. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Yeah, look at Yes, sir, they are my feather boas. Ah, uh, yep. <laughs> Protracted eye contact and everything. Mm-hmm. Well done. For the most part. The flight down was uneventful. It was the worst thing that happened was right there. So that's not too bad. That's not bad at all. But I'm glad I made the trip because I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, I need your help with something that has been more of a conundrum that it will seem like it should be at first glance here. Okay. I bought a RAID system, a capital R-A-I-D. I I have no idea what that stands for, but it's, it's a memory system. It's a storage system where I can get quick access for editing, management of my photographs, all the video clips I've shot over the years, all of that stuff. So RAID is a, there are different levels of RAID. Yes. RAID 0, RAID 1. Right. And like basically there are two hard drives, for example, simplest form, and you put something on one hard drive and the second hard drive automatically replicates itself. Dupes it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so it doubles it up. Yeah. Uh What does RAID stand for? Let me uh, me look that up. I want to know. And then- Another configuration of a RAID, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the data gets separated out using complex software. Redundant array of independent disks. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So the independent disk thing is the key here. So you have more than one disk, and it's like the file is half existing in each place, which gives you the speed benefit of two drives speed somehow working in conjunction but the issue there is that it's not backed up in a normal way. So if any of the drives fail in your yep. RAID system and you have it configured that way, it's all gone. So if you're going to do that, you have to have a boring, just mass storage, yeah. putsy, slow device to back it all up on. And usually I think people automate that. And so I got this whole system that I bought and I got it set up. Took a little, you know, a bit of a learning They're curve. They're expensive, <laughs> right? Yeah. You don't factor that in when you're like, I'm going to start making content. You don't think about that. I have mountains of data and I don't want to part ways with any of it. Dude. Because my work is cumulative. I do things that I really might need again someday. <laughs> I'd really like a shot of that 
one fresco in that one church in wherever and how much would it cost me to fly back over there and get that shot again i just want to keep it can we tell you something cool that happened to me recently in this i got an email i'm going to leave the specifics out they said hey on this episode of smarter every day you interviewed my grandfather whom i love he's passed on now and the other day i was feeling really sad and i went back to smarter every day and i watched my grandfather do you happen to have any more footage of him there you go and this episode was years old and within 10 minutes i found it huh it was years years old so it was a very interesting test for the backup system yeah and the problem with smarter every day the youtube channel i do is that we have video there's slow motion files that high speed camera when you record it's got 96 gigabytes of ram so if i click record i can generate a 96 gig file like that of ram yeah yeah it's volatile memory and so yeah you can create a file that's that big and then you have to back that up and so you could create terabytes of data so it's ram like speed memory but somehow it holds well think about what the computer is i mean what the what the thing is it's got to write files very 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 quickly yeah i suppose so it's just sitting there taking pictures the whole time Mm -hmm. and so you click the button and it'll just dump all those pictures as quick as it can happen and then that's volatile memory so if i lose power i lose that video so i have to take it from volatile memory do you know the difference in volatile and non-volatile memory? Uh, non-volatile is actually written. It goes to, uh, well, not physical media, but it's written to powered down stored media. Yeah. I, I don't know what you call it. Yeah, 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 exactly. So if you lose power on a volatile memory device, you lose the data. Yeah, like if you just popped a card out of a running camera before closing the file, yep. it would have the same effect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. So. Kind of. Well, that could be recovered. That could be recovered. still actually somewhere, isn't it? Because we did that Oh, we that did time. do that. I did that. Remember that? Well, I've done that too. I was thinking of uh, six months ago, I did that on my Sony after yeah. a mountain of work. It's just, what am I doing? Why would I? Why would I do that? Yeah. Why would I do, why would I do the thing? It's like, it's my first day at work. <laughs> Idiot. So it's, it's a thing, So man. volatile memory means that it's just there in, for lack of a better term from off the top of my head, it's there in the cache. And if you turn it off, it's gone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You have to have power to maintain the states of the bits. So it's heaps of data every time you hit record on that thing. Yes. For even a bajilla second. Yes. I think that's the unit, the bajilla second. Yeah. So long story short, I was excited that I was able to find the extra footage for that, for that yeah. individual. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Here's my question. How were you able to? How did you take the way your brain organizes things? Your, you know, I'm into this your invisible mental map of your abstract data space. There's a way that you hold it in your brain and you manifested that aspect of your imagination into a file structure on your RAID system that would make sense to you, that would cause you to be able to intuitively go and find this old clip to bless this dude who's missing his grandpa. And in a way, by giving him that file, you gave him back another hour of his grandpa's life to go and take in that was it's a lost treasure something that just cannot be replaced and you had it and you found it because of that how did you do it what was your strategy for organizing that (laughs) well that's a big question so why are you asking first of all okay can we keep a pin in that question because that's teed up pretty well but i'll tell you i'm asking because i'm going through a crisis right now that is caused by my having purchased a raid system I've got digital photography and video going back to the early 2000s. I was a very early adopter on that technology. I've cycled through a bunch of different iterations of how I organize my pictures. Finally, I can tell the era of despair was the one where I was like, I'll never sort this out. Uh, 2010s, I just dumped cell phones in there and old hard drives and anything I could find. It's just in there. I'll solve it later. Whatever. Redundancies. It's an unsearchable disaster. And I have been trying to go back through my digital life, personal and professional, and achieve what you've achieved. A sense of order 
that is a projection onto a RAID system that is reflective of how I order thoughts in my mind, not just so that it's there, but so that it's there in a way that mirrors how I think of memories and how I order those memories. And I'm finding it to be really hard to just simply pick a strategy for how to organize this stuff. Seems like a simple thing, but it's proven to be an existential thing. That's okay. why I ask. Okay. So once again, I say, how did you do it? Okay. First of all, this has happened in stages. Okay. I have thrown an incredible amount of energy at this. So the first thing I did is I bought portable hard drives. Okay. And I would use a portable hard drive for a project. And then I was like, oh, back in the day when I was doing this, you get a hard drive about 250 gigabytes or whatever it was. That's cute. Yeah. And then I could put stuff on there because I was recording on an old Fuji film, uh, fine picks, digital camera. That's what Smarter Every Day first started on. Really? Yeah. Do you still have it? I do. Huh. Yeah. It used an XD card. It didn't use an SD card. And so that was the first camera for Smarter Every Day. And the file sizes were tiny and I would export in DV format. Wow. Yeah. The, some of the very early ones were interlaced. And so I would export all this stuff and uh, I'd put them on hard drives. And it was just like the project name. And at the time, my daughter, I, I was making a lot of videos of my daughter doing silly things. I like to pretend like she was a weed eat in the yard. And I would just film her from the bottom with goggles on, like moving around. And then I would film the weed eater from the top and I would just, <laughs> a simple cut. Uh huh. I was like, oh, you see, she's not actually weed eating. You know, I thought it was great. <laughs> Then I did Godzilla for Hire, which yeah, is I remember. a thing I did for a while. And mm -hmm. then I, I did some other stuff. So anyway, I got all these and I just put them on a hard drive. That works for a while. As long as your file sizes are tiny and you can think in terms of, oh, I've created a total of six videos in my entire life. What are you at now? Doesn't matter. I don't even know. Like for Smarter Every Day, it's approaching 300. For like everything, who knows, man? I have no idea. So anyway, started moving along like that. And then I just, oh, well, that hard drive's full. I'll buy another hard drive. So this hard drive was called Cherry, C-H-E-R-R-Y, because it's red. Oh, I see what you did. Yeah. Yep. Oh, this one's Blueberry, because it was blue. That's okay. pretty easy, right? Yeah, but I'm not understanding how this is going to solve the problem long term. Right. I can see where this is headed. Oh, well, I mean, the world is so small. There are only so many colors and I mean, I'm never going to use seven hard drives. Are you crazy? It's only so many fruits, right? Yeah. I got a bunch of these hard drives and I started doing this and I was doing Firewire back in the day and all this stuff. And so then I realized, oh, wow, this is becoming a problem. Fast forward five years. I've got 30 hard drives. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is a lot of hard drives and they don't make hard drives bigger than this. What do you do? So at that point, I realized I had hard drives that did not have backups. And that's when I started to understand, oh, if I drop a spinning, what I call an iron wheel hard drive. Okay. If I drop it while it's moving, then the reader arm will deflect against the spinning disc and it will chatter and it will scratch the disc and it will ruin all the media on that hard drive. I did that once or twice and I was like, okay, I have to have backups. So at that point... I found one of my, my daughter's friend's mom. She was really good at math and she was looking for like some supplemental income. And I had just enough money. This is before Smarter Every Day was making money or like, you know, YouTuber wasn't a thing. I had just enough money where I could say, hey, for some amount of money per hour, whatever it was back then, maybe $15 or something. That's good money. Yeah. It was a big swing because you're so organized and so good. Would you mind going through these hard drives and literally writing down the file names somehow and putting them in a spreadsheet? So I have a spreadsheet that has every file name that was ever made for Smarter Every Day or before that it was called Penny Whistle Productions. I have a file name in a hard drive index. The spreadsheet is called hard drive index. See what you did? Okay. I can do several things with this. It all, all boils back to what did I make the file folder name when I made it? And also, 
I could search by date created. And so let's say, for example, is there anything you remember about any Smarter Everyday episode? Just throw anything you remember about the most obscure, anything you've ever seen me make. Uh, sure. How about uh, the moment the water comes over you when you're strapped into the helicopter crash simulation? Dunker trainer. Uh, dunker trainer. Okay, so this whole system depends on my brain. So I think dunker training. That happened in Hawaii. And that happened with the Marines on Hawaii. I know it happened in 2018. How do you know? Because that was the year that I I left working with for the army. And that was the last video I made before I left. And so we're going to depend on my brain for that Mm -hmm. much information. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then I can do other things. I can go to my email and I can search Hawaii dunker training or I can search whatever. I'm going to find a date. I'm going to find something. And then let's just do this. Can you do it here or do we need to go to the other room? I can just do it right here. Okay. So I'm going to go to my email. Crank this thing. I want to see. Okay. This is already helping. Is it really? It is. Okay. Yep. I have ideas. Okay. I'm still in existential crisis. I'm a mess. But we're getting somewhere. There there was a thing that happened that made it easier. Okay. So I'm going to go to, I've got this particular thing. So there's my hard drive index. You see it? I do. Okay, so look at all these. So it's a big spreadsheet. Okay, this says a year on it. Okay. Do you make a new one each year? Um, or do you just update the file name? Every once in a while, I'll make a new one. All right. So this one's this year. I've got one that was two years ago. Okay. Just whatever. So in this particular thing, I've got all these sheets down here. And you see this one right here that says E01? Yeah. That's a hard drive. So I had hard drives A... A1, A02, A03, and I went all the way through, and then I got to a, a different era in Smarter Every Day, and I went to hard drive labeled B. So basically, I, my early days, early, early days, I was labeling my hard drives A, B, C, D, E, and then a number. Okay? Wasn't a great system, but that's where I started. Okay. okay. So this is all still derivative of that decision you made Yep. 15 years ago. Yep. And then I go to all drives. You see this? Yeah. And so look at the top column. You see the labels of all the hard drive names. You see that? I do. You see there's DWS Cherry. There it is. Yeah. Old. So these are all the drives that you own or have data on currently. Uh, No, this is up to a certain year. So I just typed in the word dunker. Oh, look at that. I put it on hard drive D25. There it is. That's the first time it, it comes up. Okay. Day one class. This is the day one class recorded on a GoPro. This is day one class recorded on my GH5 camera. Oh my goodness. You see? GoPro ABC. Panasonic. I had three cameras, it looks like. See that? Wow. Look, there's a there's a No Dumb Questions episode we recorded. That's on that same hard drive. You see that? Really? Yeah, right there. Which one is it? Uh, I don't know what episode it was. I can tell you a date, though. Huh. So, isn't that cool? So Yeah, then- that's cool. I also have an instance of it on D17. That's a different hard drive. And I have another one on E12. That's a remarkable No, these are the proxies. These are just the proxies. What what is a proxy? So a proxy is when you have a large file. I'm sure you've done this and you ask just for the benefit of people that might not know. Maybe. (laughs) So you have a big file and you run proxies to make a smaller version of the file so that you can edit and color grade without having to use all that computational power. Yeah. So this is... How I did it, okay. it's not perfect, but it works for my mind. So I did this for a long time. If we said it's on, what did we say? Here's another. So the proxies are on hard drive E12. It's a two terabyte hard drive. Okay. I can see that that hard drive is a black Seagate. This is the serial number. And I've, I've got um, 139 gigabytes left on that hard drive. Do you do all this? No. Or is this still hired out? This was hired out. Like, I I hired this lady. It was a part-time thing, you know. She did this over the course of a couple months. Not full-time. Like, she'd do a few hours. She's great. Amazing, right? Yeah. The way she did it is she found a piece of software that you just plug a hard drive in and you, like, type in data dump on that hard drive. And it would just scan everything and it would do it all. So, she went and found a piece of hard of software that would just do this. It would scrape all the file names. Okay. Okay. And the folders and the structure. Okay. So then we dumped all that right here. Yes. Then 
We did that for years. After that, I realized if I wanted to get hard drive E12, I realized if my house burns, all of Smarter Every Day goes with it, mm. which is scary. Mm-hmm. So I got a safety deposit box and I created a hard drive and the backup and I kept them in two physical locations. I kept all the backups in the safety deposit box and the hard drives at my house. Then after a while, I was like, you know, I don't need all these hard drives. I'd rather have them in a safe place. I just got two safety deposit boxes until the day I needed something. And it was like a Sunday. <laughs> oh, I'm like, okay, I can't do that. So fast forward, I reached out to, or I forget how it worked out. Linus, um, Sebastian from Linus Tech Tips. Mm-hmm. I talked to him about what can I do? And and he had this relationship with a company called 45 Drives. Okay. And so we installed, I did a Smarter Everyday episode on this. We installed a RAID hard drive system here. Sorry, I missed this episode. It's not ringing a bell. <laughs> nah, this is something we did. We have that, but the problem is it wasn't fast enough to edit off of. What? Why not? Because they were spinning hard drives. It was a RAID array, but you just couldn't get, because I edit in 4K footage. Same. So I just couldn't, I couldn't push the data that I needed. I needed a blowtorch of a data stream. Okay. So fast forward. What do you mean by blowtorch? What would be the speed that you're hoping to to get? Gigabit Ethernet access. Okay. So fast forward to now. And now the way I handle my, what I call the deep vault is an LTO drive. Do you know what that is? No, I do not. Linear tape optimized. Hmm. That's a magnetic tape backup. What? It's a magnetic tape. That's here at your house? Yeah. Show me. Okay, I'll be right back. No, I mean, let's just, here, let's just walk. Going on a field trip. So it's actual tape? Like our yeah. ancestors used? Yeah. Yeah, this is it right here. So this is... That's huge. Uh, this is a MagStore tape backup drive. See that? And It looks like an 8-track player. It does. Yeah, and so this specific type of tape is called LTO-8. So that's it right there. It's a cartridge. It looks like an 8-track. Yeah. That's absurd. So that's 12 terabytes. No way. There's actually an LTO-9 now. This tape backup drive is quite expensive. I think it's it was very it was a big investment. It's like I want to say four thousand dollars. Oh my goodness! It's, it's nuts, dude. It's crazy. But I've paid that much for one piece of equipment ever, and it was my editing computer. Yeah, that's the biggest outlay I've ever had. So this thing right here, once you make that initial investment of the tape backup drive, yeah, or whatever you want to call that, then you buy these tapes, and they're like fifty bucks a piece. Okay, that's pretty cheap for exactly. 12 so, terabytes. So it's like 12. The dollar per gigabyte, this is the most optimized storage you can get. And is in terms of storage, it's the best long-term solution. Magnetic tape is better than a solid-state drive? My understanding, I could be wrong about solid that. Solid-state drives are so expensive for... Yeah, in terms of dollar per gigabyte. Yeah. But this is the way. Yeah. And so even... Amazon, like if you were to buy AWS, Amazon Web Services, or whatever it's called, basically you pay Amazon to store your data on the cloud. They use tape backup. Do they really? They do, yeah. And they have robotic systems that will go, literally robots, that will go and pull a tape out of the Dewey Decimal type deal. I don't know how they do it, but they have barcodes they will literally have robots scan barcodes and they know where everything is. It's, it's amazing. So but, that's a deep storage. You're not accessing that like Google Drive. You're correct. The AWS, I mean. Correct. But, but this, you, all you have to do is know which tape backup you would need. And then how do you actually access it? Does this connect? Is this Ethernet to yeah. the whole system? Absolutely. The, the unfortunate part about this is that it's loud. So it's, it's off right now. Okay. So when I, the other day... How loud? Yeah, I'll show you. Let me turn it on here. It's a power switch in the back. I just turned it on. You hear it spinning up? Oh, I do. Okay, it's not the end of the world loud. That's not it yet. It's not spun up. Oh, there's a tape in there right now? Nope. Nope, it's it's just now waking up. Okay. 
it has to spool up everything. You see it coming online? I do. Problem is with tape, if you think about how tape works, if you have data on a disk, like literally the geometric description of a disk. You just move over the disk to get what you want. Correct. Like Here you have player. to go to the tape like the olden days when I wanted to play a cassette. You can't skip between tracks like a CD. You have to fast forward or rewind and spool it out to get where you want on the magnetic tape. Exactly. You, you hear it waking up now? I do hear it. It's still not appallingly loud. Okay. Yeah, it's online right now. But do you hear that high frequency whine? I do. So that's annoying to me. So what I'm going to do is I'll put this tape in and uh, listen to it, grab and pull it in. That feels really old school. Wow. This feels like throwback technology. It doesn't feel new. Yeah, but in terms of being able to store the most amount of stuff, that's that's it. That's how you do it. Huh. So then you can see here on the computer, yeah, you have to mount that drive. Sure. Now this particular tape is empty. I formatted it wrong and I named it incorrectly. And so I've I've set this one aside. You see it's still not mounted. The problem with this Okay, spooling up, you hear it? Is it gonna spool through that whole thing in order to mount the drive? No. My understanding of how it works is that it has a little portion of the tape in one section where it kind of keeps up with what's on it. This computer is just a little, I don't know if you can see it, like that's the tape backup drive. It's, it's in a, a network rack. Yeah. But I have a little Mac mini back here. I did not see that, let me look. It's a, it's a little Mac computer. Right oh here. gosh, <laughs> it looks like a router. Ooh, oh, here, yikes. Hear it waking up? Okay, that's loud. Okay, it was done. It just, um, this is a program right here called Canister. All of these right here, these are all my tape backup drives that have been indexed. Oh my goodness. And if you double click in any one of those, that is what is on that drive. Okay, so that's give, what I'm looking at right now in your file explorer is what is indexed, but if you double click on that, we can't pull it up right now. We have to put in the tape. Correct. Obviously. Yeah. <sighs> okay, now I'm feeling more intimidated. <laughs> I learned something. I liked the learning. I've looked at this robot many times and thought that's a lot of jumper cables and that's- Patch cables, yeah. I mean, that's just a lot. We heading back to the mics? Yeah. That's expensive and a lot, man. But your stuff is like, groundbreaking footage of like slow motion tracking the snap of a whip and all my stuff's just mostly fart jokes. <laughs> I don't know if I want to spend that much. I mean, there's some really funny ones. No. Like stuff people haven't thought of before, dude. <laughs> Cutting edge fart jokes. Well, what, what are you, well, so, okay. So that's smarter every day. That's how I do that. When I got through the hard drive thing, mm -hmm. then I just have a little network drive, like 20 gigabytes. That's All right. pretty significant. Sure. But then I'll edit off of the network drive. So I, I'll have a few projects going at any one time. And then once I finish the project, then I'll dump it to an LTO. Okay. That's where I'm at now. And so now I, I never have that step where I go to something else, you know, like I go to some weird hard drive in between. So now I just say date. I'll say I go to a kid's sports event. I, I will just go year, month, date, or smarter every day episode number. That's what I do now. Okay. Yeah. So you got on deck, active, and archived, and that's pretty much it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is this helpful at all? I mean, yes. Oh, it's very helpful. I've often wondered how you do all of this because you just have a ton of data management. But you said that's the smarter every day side. What do you do on the personal side with all the photographs and family stuff? Or if you take a trip, travel, how do you keep track of where all that is? So you saw on the uh, the canister index, you saw that one standout. It was one LTO that said Sandlin family. Did you okay. see that? And so that's where if I want wedding photos, I'm going there. You know, I've got stuff there and it's all organized by year. You went year. Yeah. And then... 
I will go in and dump my phone every year. And you just call that Destin 20 iPhone backup 19 or iPhone. when I had a Samsung Destin Samsung backup piece of crap Samsung 2017 no monkey it was piece fun. of crap garbage phone. No it was a beautiful thing about the Android stuff is there's a there's a card in it I could just dump it all the cards really nice It's very nice Yeah I like that Yeah Huh you went by year That's interesting to me Okay well let's start on the the work side Can I unpack my system a little bit and you can give me some therapy here and <laughs> tell me what you do Okay this episode of No Dumb Questions is supported by listeners like you who uh, are crazy enough to pitch in and make it keep going so we can pay people like Tina, who's editing this thing that I'm doing right now. What we did is we asked people on uh, No Dumb Questions Patreon page. We said, hey, we reached out directly to people, said, would you be willing to tell us why you support? Because we kind of want to study you in a lab and understand what's going on in your mind so we can try to replicate you so that we have financial freedom with this thing. And then we got a response from Andrew. Uh, it was upside down and backwards, but we had to reverse the audio and flip it back over. I don't know why it was like that, but but we'll uh, we'll go ahead and play it for you now, and uh, we'll hear from Andrew. G'day, fellas. Andrew here. Thanks for making life better for me and my family of eight in the land down under. We started listening very early on and became winged to SARS in 2019. My son Josiah put it best when he said it's nice to have something funny and formative and genuinely interesting to listen to while still being clean. Our favourite parts so far have been anything Barnacles and Testicles, The Red Baron, Caesar, Merkel's Boner, Urinal Confessions, PV equals NRT, and Sleep Paralysis. We honestly love you guys, and if you were ever in Queensland, Australia, we'd be happy to have you around for a fee. Andrew, did I understand correctly? Like, we can come visit you for a fee? Like, we have to... Okay. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> We're grateful that uh, Andrew supports on patreon.com slash no questions. It means the world. Seriously, Andrew, it's a, it's a big deal, so we're grateful. If you feel at all like Andrew does, except you don't live in Australia and you would like to support, we would appreciate your support on Patreon. Thank you very much. Okay, my first camera was a Panasonic point-and-shoot. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just a simple little Panasonic about the size of a baseball card, but it had a a nice optical zoom lens on it, and it had the same sensor as the GH4. Maybe the 4? Maybe whatever was before. It had a great sensor. It really it looked pretty good. Mm -hmm. It always wanted to cheat orange. It really nudged toward warm all the time. Uh, it might have been just my own mistakes, but I, I think it it really leaned that way. It had a certain look to it, certain distortion to that lens. And, you know, it's fine. It's a good place to start, whatever. I didn't even have, like, microphone audio. I used a Tascam stand-up recorder. I'd mm -hmm. hide it behind a mug on my desk yeah. when I started. It's all echoey and terrible now. Yep. Like, I don't know. Just, you learn things as you go along. And everything you learn seems to take up more space. So then I went to uh, Canon that I bought at Target one time. I didn't really understand that you probably shouldn't buy your professional work camera at Target if you can help it, but I found a little kit and it's what I could afford. My second camera was a, a Canon T1i. Yeah. I think I had the consumer, oh, I had a Rebel. Like, you remember the yeah, Andre what, Agassi camera? <laughs> yeah, the T1i was the first digital Rebel. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I had that. It was cheap and plastic. Mm -hmm. Did okay. I bought some lenses for it, you know. It just wasn't ever a great look. Uh, my buddy Nate and I always called it the Tandy or the Texas Instruments or the, you know, <laughs> like any old brand we can yeah, think yeah. of that's now mostly defunct. We'd call it that. Then I got a, a GH4. I mean, I just, I looked at your gear. That's what you were using. I managed to find one for cheap used on eBay and as a good camera, but the autofocus was trash. So finally, eventually the final form was saved at my pennies. I bought a sony a7s3 oh brother it's good right? it's invincible it's so amazing and so the reason i haven't I, I heard a lot of people like the a7s3 but the reason i don't use that is the selfie cam is important to me yeah a lot of smarter every day i, I flip that screen out to the side to me as well yeah can you do that That's on the sony the, yeah oh really oh yeah yeah i mean that was an absolute deal breaker if i couldn't do it if I'm doing the walk and talk, like a self-guided tour of something, or I want to explain some stained glass or speculate about some art in a church or a sculpture or something, I will flip that little monitor around. 
I can see myself and it just throws a box around one eye. And if the box is there, it means we are locked in on that autofocus. Whereas <gasps> That's awesome. with the Panasonic, I get that like blue zebra kind of stuff. Yeah. And it loves my beard. Uh huh. And so it lies and it says I'm in focus when I'm not because there's something about the way it reads a beard. Uh huh. That lies. So I intentionally have to cheat it out of focus according to the zebra ing in order to make it look like it's working it just doesn't work for that so purpose you think for me. about yes so when i'm making a video the amount of things that are going on in my head uh -huh. when i'm talking to somebody about rockets on a video is ridiculous yes. and most of it's not about rockets yes <laughs> yeah. oh yeah dude i'm not as good at this as you are but i totally understand i'm trying to Listen to the Orthodox priest who kind of doesn't like me anyway. <laughs> Tell me about the shrine and he's sort of frustrated that I exist. Yeah, yeah. And I'm trying to listen to him talk about St. Photios and his anathemas regarding the filioque, filioque laws. Bless you. In the ninth century. But also I'm like, oh, but dude, you're telling me that standing right under that light and it's giving you raccoon eyes. Oh, absolutely. And I'm just going to awkwardly get closer to you until you feel weird and move back out of that light. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm running those kind of calculations and yeah, I don't know what I'm doing, but I've got a ton of footage of me not knowing what I'm doing. And so my workflow has gradually become what yours is. I got the on deck circle and literally that's what I call the folder on deck circle. Mm -hmm. Edit these at some point. I mean, I've got 30 videos, viable videos in the can right now that I just haven't got to yet. Wow. Because I kind of have to stagger what tradition I do. I can't do like five Catholic videos in a row where the algorithm thinks I'm Catholic and it doesn't give my videos to anybody else anymore. Hmm. So I have to pepper it with different traditions and different <laughs> ideas or I just end up more in the doghouse than I already am. So I got the on deck circle, then I got the active editing folder, and then I... I've had the archives, which is just this ever growing 12 terabyte Amazon.com stack of mega hard drives. You have to physically plug into power and then you have to run USB connection. I'm out of ports. It's overdone. I can't edit off of any of these. No. And so finally, I was like, all right, I'm going to try to do what you did. Now, I saw in there that you had a QNAP system. Correct. That's what I went and bought. Wow. And that's that, a swing, man. Is it? I mean, I mean, it's expensive. It was expensive. Yeah. yeah. I bought it used. Okay. That helped. And what I found was the thing's supposed to be run through my Ethernet yeah. setup, and then I can get 10, 10 gig. I can get 10 gig out of it. Okay. It's all in the wrong room. I didn't want long cables, whatever. I'm like, I'll just run it direct and have it all happen offline. I found a way to cheat that. I can get 2.5 out of it that way. Okay. I just cannot believe how quickly I can access. Whatever I have in there, 30, 36, I mean, it's just massive, ton, 36 terabytes, maybe 30 terabytes. And it's great. It's Yours is bigger than mine. I, editing. Think, I think I'm at 20 terabytes. Yeah, there's a lot there and it flies and I'm running at a quarter the speed that it's capable of when I get the setup all right. So I'm very excited about that. I've been working on a backup system and all of that's well and good. I think my professional workflow is starting to come together. What isn't coming together is trying to fileize my personal life. It's out of control, man. And so then I sat down, I bought this system. I'm like, all right, I'm going to partition this little bit over here metaphorically, not like actually make a partition. I know it's not that kind of drive. And I'm going to, I'm going to take this section over here. I'm going to organize tens of thousands of pieces of media about my kids and my life and even stuff I've written. I want to go in there, personal recordings, Things from my, I want to try to archive recordings of my great grandparents that I still have. Like, I want this to be the treasure trove. If you find this drive, you found it. The historian would know what to do with this if you wanted to tell such a story. But the one remaining question, how do I order it? You went by years. Mm -hmm. So I started going by years. But then I started being like, well, I'm missing on so many of these. And I'd go and verify and I missed by four years. It's just memory. It, it's too much time. I had an experience very similar to this in 2003 and say 2008. Well, which one was that? I looked the same in both of those years. And so I'm, I discover I'm starting to make mistakes with where they go. Not from like 
you know, hardcore forgetfulness or slipping or anything, but there were similar trips, similar circumstances. It's not working. And I realized that I think the best way for me to do this, and I want you to help me troubleshoot it because I'm not positive or convinced, is by location. I think I think more in terms of space than I do in terms of timeline, which as a history person seems really weird. You would think timeline would be obviously how I would think about the past, but it's so much more natural for me to sort this stuff by this is how my it currently looks. And this is just an iteration. The first level of my folder of all of my images and memories and everything is countries. Was it? So, I mean, the United States is pinned because I'm there a lot. And then inside of that is cities or subregions. So for the United States, it's all states. So a very busy folder for me is United States, Wyoming, and then uh, down to city from there. So United States, Wyoming, Yellowstone. At that point, it seems like I can more or less get what I want to, and then I can just sort by date. And I mean, I've been to Yellowstone 50 times. So how am I going to sort through all those pictures? Well, I guess I just have to go with whatever date is tagged on the photo to try to make sense of the thing. So before I ask you my next question, upside, downside of that, what do you see as being the problem if I put more time into that and go further down this road? What am I going to run into 30 years from now that is going to be a problem sorting it that way now? Let me ask you this. What is the purpose of sorting the files? I don't know. I just don't want it to get more out of control. Some obvious purposes. Um, I'd like to have the footage. Anything I've taken a picture of is free archival footage that I can use on projects. That's really nice to have. Also, I suppose this is it. I want someone to look at the stuff I did someday. Not the stuff I published. Like the stuff I did. I hope my kids or grandkids will be curious about it. I'm making a bucket of skipping rocks that I find all around the world. Anywhere I find a cool skipping rock. I grab it. I throw it in the bucket. The bucket is only to be used by the first generation of kids after I am gone. I'm thinking in those categories. I, I live in a time where people a generation after I am dead, who are my descendants, can kind of know me. If I make it hard, they're not going to know me. If I make it easy, I can be a part of their life a little bit. And this hard drive to me is... Uh, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm happy. I plan on being alive for a very, very, very long time. But it's kind of one of the disciplines in my life right now where I realize I'm sort of preparing for death. I'd like to make sense of it. I don't want to ask somebody else later to have to do this work. It's my responsibility and I should make sense of it. I suppose that's what I'm trying to accomplish. Have you ever cleaned out a house when someone dies? I've cleaned out a room when a kid brother died. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Can you keep everything? No, we didn't. It was hard. Yeah. I think if Mark had been 91 when he died, it would have been a lot easier to clean that place out. But he was 18. Yeah. That made every single item absolutely bitter. I, we did it in one day. Yeah. And I still have the items I picked. And we're moving some stuff around right now in my life. We have a little bit of chaos. And so I got my one bucket of memory stuff. Like I popped that thing open. It, it's, it's a, a musty version, but it still smells like him. The tiniest little bit, right? So I'm glad I saved something. But also I'm glad I'm not moving, moving 40 boxes of yeah. whatever my brother happened to own when he was 18. You just can't keep it all. Look behind you right there. See those boxes right there? The white ones? Yeah. Yeah? Those are film photos that I shot. Really? Yeah. If I grab that right now, that's what's in there? Yeah. Grab any one of those. Yeah. And so those are film photos. I, I have them digitally backed up. Can I can open it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's medium format film. I just, you're not going to want to unwind. Well, you can. You can just wind it back I'll just up. go a tiny little bit. Yeah. Just hold it up to the light. You got two of them there. You want to separate it. So you just I get I want to just look at one picture yeah. at a time. It's better. Yeah. Those are film photos and okay. they, they mean something to me. And the cool thing about the film is that it was physically there. Whatever you're looking at there, the film was there. Can you figure out what it is just by looking at it? It's surprisingly difficult to figure out what I'm looking at right now, but I'm not giving up. <laughs> the point is those boxes over there, they're, they're not very organized, but I've got them organized digitally because I have scans of all those. But I still like the idea of keeping the negative. If you look 
right here between you and I, there's a drawer. Oh, these are kids. Uh, they're playing in like a children's play area. There's like a fire pole, and a kiddo is sliding down a fire pole. That's cool. One's playing on like a, uh, it looks like a big like a mushroom pad kind of seat or something. Oh, really? Yeah. Let's see, see that doesn't mean a lot to you. Let me see. Next oh, roll. Oh, the next roll. Yeah, that looked like the ocean. Oh, that's my son at a high jump. Well, I was not close on that. That's what that one was. Let's see what this one is. Oh, that's a. Uh, they're at a uh, a trampoline place, a trampoline park. Okay. It's the kids at trampoline park. That's cool. So that means a lot to me mm -hmm. because it's their youth and childhood and all that. So I have a plan eventually to go through those and just take time and go through those. But look at this drawer right here between us. All right. See these? Those look much older. Yeah. Can I have one of those? Yeah. Okay, let me describe this here. This looks... Read it. It looks like a wallet. It's old. It smells it smells like a very old book from a library. It says Eastman negative album, capacity 100, size two and a half by four and a quarter. All right. Uh, so a these date on there. No. So these are photos from a man named Robert Kennedy. You've shown me some of the stuff that you ended up with from Robert Kennedy. No relation. No relation to the politician. But not in this format. I haven't seen these kind of these books at all. What is this? How does it work? So basically, these are envelopes that are all assembled in a book. And in the envelopes, you can see he's got them numbered. As best I can tell, this individual, Robert Kennedy, he was quirky. He seems to be very intelligent. He may have been some level of autistic, perhaps. Mm. I don't know. Maybe that's not fair. Yeah, maybe he's just organized. But the person I bought these from, they went through and they, and they started selling these negatives on eBay. And I found one from my hometown. And it was a photo that I had taken with a modern camera. So and, he deigned to point his camera at one you had pointed your camera at. Correct. And I was looking for old photo negatives on eBay one night. And I found the I was like, wait a second. I took that photo. But this guy took it like 60 years before me. And so, look, on the first few pages, he's organized everything. Yeah. Read Let's a few of those. Keep going through it. I want to see more of these locations. Let's read it. This is, what I'm hoping is that I'm going to know some of these places. Looks like he took the pictures in the 1950s. Uh, view from Lookout Mountain. There's a lot of Lookout Mountains. Table you, Rock, Tennessee. Okay, so that's the Lookout Mountain in Chattanooga. Along Rock River near Oregon. View from Castle Rock, Illinois. Roosevelt Carr, 1929. St. Louis Cathedral, New Orleans. State Capitol, Indianapolis. Bridal Moss Covered Oaks, Palm City, Palm Drive City Park. Oh, Lake Pontchartrain. Yeah. So this guy took these photos. I don't know what kind of camera he took them with, but they're beautifully shot. And he organized them. And then he died. And somebody got his photos. A, uh, an estate salesman bought these and started going through them and selling the ones that had value. For example, in Indianapolis, Indiana, you know, if you had a restaurant there, you might want an old photo of Indianapolis. Oh. You'll, you'll notice those are sold out of the, the books. So the photos that are left, Clever. the ones that are left here, we still have remnants in like, it, this is almost like, you know, in the Bible where it says, and, and the rest of the story is recorded in the book of Edo yeah. or whatever. Sure. It's yeah. like that. And so you see where there was a photo of, read one of them. As for the other events of his reign, are they not all written down in the book of Jasher? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, for example, right here, there's there's an empty spot. The, the Palisades on the Hudson River. Photo 749. That's not here. I bet that was saleable. Oh, no, no. Actually, I've got it right here. Look at that boat. Look at that boat. He took pictures of the World's Fair in Chicago. Did he really? Century of Progress, Midway, Chicago. Yeah, that Look one's... Look at that. Isn't that cool? So I bought these from a dealer in Missouri. The reason I bought them is because I have been accused in the past of having a uncontrollable desire to document things. Who accused you of that? 
Well, they didn't accuse me. It's a, a mutual friend of ours that said, uh, he, he said, I don't have whatever it is you have where you feel like you have to document everything. Okay. I don't think I have to document everything, but I like to. I purchased these photos. Because is it I, if I open another one while you yes, talk? Yes, sir. Because I realized that this individual did exactly what I do and documents their life. Yeah. And nobody is looking at the photos through the eyes of the individual. People only value these photos because it's an old photo of a place that they know in modern times. But I want to look at the photos from the perspective of Mr. Mr. Kennedy's life. Does that make sense? Yes. What have you found? Just an interesting person. He, he really liked model trains. He really liked actual trains. Um, he likes bridges. He finds natural landscapes interesting. Huh. I don't know. He I, finds this, the same kind of places I find interesting, interesting. Right? He's got Savannah, Illinois. My family's from there. Really? Yeah, he went to Savannah, Illinois and snapped pictures. Straight up, my grandpa's buried there. Really? Yeah, his funeral was there. This guy was well-traveled. That's awesome. Dubuque, Iowa. I grew up 20 minutes from Dubuque, Iowa. When I was a little, little kid, I lived in eastern Iowa for a while. My mom is from that part of the world. The Chicago World Fair, Century of Progress, 1938. He's there taking pictures and all that stuff. Uh, look at this. He's taking pictures oh, in Davenport, shut Iowa. Up, what dude. is it? Holy cow. Show me the thing. It's a new, don't mess this one up. This I statue, that's in New Orleans. That's French Quarter, New oh, Orleans. Oh, yeah, that's Jackson. That's the Jackson. That's Andrew Jackson. I, I just it. shot a statue video at Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C. talking about that statue. Yes, I know exactly what we're looking at. That's amazing. And so, like, dude, I went and sat in front of this statue and yes. I took a video of this and this joker shot it. Yes. With his camera. Yes. And I randomly pulled that out. Man, that's that's astonishing. So are you... Okay, as this pertains to my conundrum about why I want to organize these files and the best way to do it, you have a good organizational mind. As it pertains to that, are you saying Mr. Kennedy wasted his time organizing this stuff because nobody looks at it now? Or that it has value because you chose to buy it? Or that it has value because just implicitly it has value and organizing it was a gift to the future? Tie it in for me. The gentleman that I bought these from, he's a nice man. He's in Missouri. I contacted him and I said, hey, man, are you selling these one at a time? And he's like, yeah. I was like, you're breaking them up? He's like, well, yeah, I can make more money that way. I said, what would it take for just, just take them all off eBay? He only sold them in, you know, batches of a couple dozen at a time. Mm -hmm. He's like, dude, I, I have so many more of these. I'm just doing it slowly. I said, well, can I just buy everything you have on eBay right now? I think he was selling them for like somewhere between five and 14 hours a piece, depending on what the photos were. So I bought several of them and then I talked to him and I, I bought the whole lot, like his whole, everything he had. And it's my understanding that uh, I just recently called this guy again and he found some more. What? Yeah. Except this time he found Kodachrome slides, color. So Mr. Kennedy documented all these things from whatever this era is all the way up to the sixties. And so I'm, I told the gentleman, I was like, Hey, don't, mail them to me i'd like to come see you and and get them from you just because i want to have a conversation with him because i think he's cool so anyway i say all this to say you want people to go back in time and look at your life and that's what i'm doing with this guy and i don't know him and i don't know what to do with this but but i i find it to be interesting one thing i'm really interested in is i'm thinking about scanning all of these and then putting them just putting them out there putting them together some of the shots he took were brilliant. I mean, we're going to turn off mics here in a minute. And I'm going to sit here and continue to look through every last one of these. It's cool, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's super cool. And I'm so disappointed. There's a shot that I just found here that's called Chicago Lakefront 1933. I would want to see that picture. I lived it's in Chicago gone. for five years. It's gone. Yeah. Of course it's gone. Dang it. Right? Yeah. But you can you Apparently can kind he of was from Chicago. Uh yeah, I got his address right here. Yeah. He wrote it down. Yep. Chicago proper. 101331. Third nineteen thirty one. That's what it says. It's about a hundred years old. This so, has incredible value to me because of the humanity of it. Yes. 
And I feel a connection with this guy right now because at some point he thought to himself, how can I organize my files up in such a way that there's some record of these travels and the stuff I saw and there's some cohesive story he edited. This isn't everything he curated. And in a way, a hundred years later, I don't know when Mr. Kennedy died, say a hundred years later, this is one of the few visual remnants of his life. Yeah. And here you and I are talking about it with a whole bunch of people sitting in the third chair. And the fact that he put in the thought and the effort is not to be sappy, a blessing to us. I want my stuff that's a product of my eye and my priorities and what I think is beautiful or interesting. I want to put in the work to curate that in a way that is considerate to people in the future, the same way that when I hold this little booklet from Mr. Kennedy, he didn't know he was doing me specifically a favor, but he did. Because if it was just a giant dump of stuff, yeah, there's something interesting in there somewhere, good luck, future people, I wouldn't be holding it. But that this guy was careful and thoughtful about other people potentially seeing his work is why I get to enjoy it and see it now. It wouldn't be in my hand otherwise. So I want to organize it in a way that is sort of my brain proof a little bit. And so maybe I should go by years the way you're doing it. I mean, I'm probably getting close to a work week into it effort wise. I mean, I've really got some work in it, but there's still time for me to change my organizational strategy to make it thoughtful for people in the future. But I found this guy because he organized by place. I disagreed with you at first when you're you're like, yeah, I should do it by place. I was just sitting there saw thinking. saw that in your eyes. Yeah, you saw it. I was sitting there thinking, man, that's crazy. That doesn't make any sense. And then I thought about these. I was like, okay. Like for me, in order for me to access the information and find it quickly, it's got to be by year. Because then I can go to my, my email address and I can find it. Oh. Like give me another thing. I mean, just whatever. Can you think of any other smarter everyday things? Yeah, of course. Uh, gravity light. Gravity light. Okay, great. So I went to Salisbury Cathedral and I did that. I have no idea what year that is. So I'm just going to go to the old, well, I'll just go to the spreadsheet here. Yeah, there it is. Uh, D29. That's Two incredible. 2017. Did you know that was in 2017? No, I had no idea. It's all on hard drive EO2. Huh. My method of year on my folders only works with this. And I've often thought if something happens to me, the proverbial bus that's going to hit me that we always talk about. <laughs> like my kids are not going to know what to do with this. No, they're not going to. This guy made it easy. He just wrote it down. So you maybe need one more iteration of this as well. But also, dude, your kids don't need to look through 50 failed attempts to light a match with a 22 that that's been fired from a bolted stationary rifle. I would watch Edgerton do that. <laughs> <laughs> Harold Edgerton at MIT. I would watch him do that. But my kids don't need to because they have to live their own life. They don't need to see all 50 attempts is the point. They need to see a couple that failed and one that worked to get the story. But that's not what they would be watching for. What would they be watching for if they watched 50 slow motion videos of you trying to do something? Well, they wouldn't watch the slow motion videos. They would watch me and John Henry in the garage and they would see us mess up and they would see if we laughed or if we got mad. That's what they would figure out. And they'd be like, oh, John Henry laughing. They keep screwing it up and he keeps laughing. That's great. They were pretty positive. That's kind of his power, isn't it? Laugh at himself on CCTV cameras. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it seems like he's real good at that. He's really good at that. <laughs> okay. Final question. Okay. What about editing? Oh, gosh. What if you... No, no, no. I mean, in the process of curation. So let's say you go on the same journey I'm on right now and you're like, I'm going to take iPhone 2019 and I'm going to organize up those pictures so future generations don't have to. And so I make some kind of sense of this story, learn things about myself, preserve things for the future, whatever. And let's say you're going through it and uh, there's a picture that isn't super evergreen, a joke that was funny in 2019, but wasn't funny three months later. But whoever sees it down the road isn't going to know what newsworthy event happened three months later. And they're not going to get it. And it just looks dumb and you won't be there to explain it. Do you delete that? Or is there some moral obligation to just be like, nope, that's my life. These are the pictures we took. That's where we were. I don't, I can't think of 
anything that would I don't know. I've never heard clearly think, you have not gone back through and curated. <laughs> I've never had to think about that. No, why do you think it? Well, because I would have my answer to that question would have been I keep, don't think there's a single picture I've ever taken that I would be like, oh, I don't really like the way that reflects. Yeah, I'm yeah. fine with all of it until I went and started doing this. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a few where I'm like, huh. Yeah. I, that sort of needs a little context to get it. It almost feels like that picture tells a little different story than the actual story. Oh, interesting. If you're standing there and you can see what's happening off camera, the whole thing makes perfect sense. And in the moment, we're like, well, we'll remember forever. Okay. We can fill in the rest of the story. But when I'm not there to fill into the, the rest of the story, there were a few pictures where I was like, the most natural way to interpret that would be not in a way that I would find particularly flattering or accurate or reflective of what it actually was. Maybe I'll just make that one go away. But then I hover over the delete button. Is that dirty? Is that dishonest? So, so someone that I love dearly sent me a photo the other day that they, they found a photo. It's this person. You know that person? Uh, I think I do. Okay. Yep. Yep. I know that person. Sure. So, so this per person sent me a photo of them without context. And if you look at it now. Yep. If you look at it now, that photo doesn't work. Right. But there's a lot of layers as to why that makes sense then. Yes. And doesn't make sense now. Yes. That simply doesn't mean the same thing. Yes. When I assume that photo was taken. Yep. Simply doesn't. I see what you're saying is my point. Uh, if you became the custodian of that common acquaintance of yours and mine. Yeah. If you became the custodian of their hard drive that they left behind their RAID system with all their pictures on it. You're like, I'm going to go through this thing before anybody else gets a look at it. You come across that one. Do you just delete it? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I came across something from somebody one time. I was like, yeah, that's going away. That's going down the forever hole. <laughs> was it me? No, it wasn't. Okay. No. <laughs> I can't think of anything. I was like, dude, I, I think I'd want to know, but <laughs> wait a second to tell me. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I can remember seeing something and being like, yeah, that's not who that person was. Taken out of context, this looks bad. I made that decision. You know what I'm thinking of. I do. You, yeah. It's, it's such a weird, weird story. But I was the custodian of something one time. And I made an executive decision to be like, yeah, that's out of context and it's going away. I think that's fine. And or so it's exactly in context and it's going away. <laughs> like <laughs> either way, it's going away. I don't know if it's a function of the moment in life that I'm in, but I am Camilla when we were having kids, she felt clearly a biological impulse toward nesting. We got to get this place. That it's, I mean, it's been like a gamer lounge for us to hang out in and just watch shows and bum around. It's just functional so we can get out and do all the things we do. We don't do anything at home anyway. Who cares? All of a sudden, who is this lady? She's got a little bump on her tummy and now all she wants to do is look at cribs and pastel paint colors. <laughs> like she just transformed before my eyes priority wise. In the same way that I watched that happen almost as a function of biology for her. I am feeling this deep impulse to curate. And for the first time ever, I'm really feeling a desire to be thoughtful toward people after I am gone. Even though I do not anticipate being gone in any kind of foreseeable future, I'm just starting to feel interested in that. It's like my messy hard drives are a metaphor for a narrativeless life. I know the narrative. I'm the keeper of it. I like it, even the bad parts. I like my narrative. I get my story. I can track it almost like a a waveform, the ups and downs, peaks and valleys, all of that. I can see my picture uh, or I can, I can see my story on a graph almost like that. But nobody else probably can or not many other people probably can. And so all those pictures, stuff I wrote, little word files, things like that, it all kind of adds up to telling a story. I don't need to totally curate it so that I inflict my version of my story on other people, but I'd like it to be organized enough that people could get a little bit of a taste of it. We're not presidents, man. Papers Yet. are pay. Yeah. Our papers aren't going to go to a library, right? It's <sighs> it's not like we're Isaac Newton and like, well, there was some correspondence between these two scientists back in, you know, are people going to read your emails? You think? Well, I'm not making any effort on that. So, I mean, <laughs> go ahead. Knock yourself out. Did you know that Sticker Mule is new doing another promotion? Get $19 uh, right, exactly. for 50 buttons. Yeah. Enjoy my email, suckers. Yeah. I don't clean any of that garbage. Right.
I don't know. Do people whose stuff gets gone through because something meaningful happened in their life know that the whole time? Like, do they know that when they're 20 or 25 or 40? When do you get notified people are going to go through all your stuff later and care about it? I don't know. I don't know either. So probably not, but I'm not thinking of famous. I'm not, and I don't intend to be that. I'm thinking of family history. Dude, I'd go through everything if I had Valentine Whiteman's hard drive. I want to know. We get these huge gaps. I would love to read what Edward Whiteman was thinking in his journal from prison after the first time he got burned and then recanted and got taken off the stake by King James. And then was like, no, that's actually what I believe. And then actually stayed on the stake and got burned all the way to death. What happened in his brain between burning number one, abortive burning number one, and full-fledged burn you till you die number two? I would love to know that. I'm a part of something much bigger than myself, family-wise. So I'd kind of like this to be an arc, a preservation of memory for the family. I, everything I learn about my ancestors, I feel like I kind of get me for better or for worse more. I don't know that it's for like some sort of grand archival self-important thing, but I kind of like to be generationally present in ways that some of the generations before me were not. Is that bad? I mean, maybe maybe that is narcissistic. I don't know. I think my family has way too much access to me. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm tired of hearing myself when you're editing, you know what it's like when you're editing and you hear like. you hear yourself 10 times. That's why we have Tina do this. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> Jeff gets the daily thing. Tina gets this. And it's still too much. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to inflict more of me. Okay. On on the future generations. <laughs> okay. The, I mean, that's an interesting thing, right? Like I, I, I was listening to a comedian. He was talking about the amount of access you have to your grandmother. And he was saying like, look, my grandmother, I've got some, some old film photos of her opening presents in Christmas in the seventies, right? Future generations. They're going to have TikTok videos of their grandma twerking. Yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. That's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of their grandma twerking at their grandma's funeral, or whatever. I don't know what they do on TikTok, yeah, yeah. but that seems like the kind of thing that would happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like we're we're just making digital tattoos all over the place. So you run the other way, do less. I don't know. This is what I know for sure. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. What I do know is it's a mess, and it kind of feels like a metaphor for a messy, unkempt narrative. And I'd at least like to just put it in some folders instead of one big dumpster folder. I think my brain would feel better. And if you're telling me that you don't see any obvious deep pitfalls to the approach that I'm taking, then I think I'll just keep taking it and we'll let somebody else sort out whether that was worthwhile. So one thing I do, and I, I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, is I have a, a secret YouTube channel mm -hmm. with unlisted videos. Mm -hmm. It's for the family. While you're doing this, let's say you go through and you find Yellowstone 2018. Mm -hmm. Every video clip in that, just throw it on Adobe Premiere on the timeline and then just export it. And then scrub it real fast to make sure, like, you know, the kids aren't swimming in a pool or something, whatever. You know, they, they fall out of their bathing suit or something like that. Just scrub it real quick, make sure everything's cool, and then make an unlisted video and send the link to that unlisted video to your family. Yes. I didn't know if we were talking about that into microphones. Yeah. But that's the other layer to this project. Yeah. I, do. I have the same YouTube channel and I'm working to populate it with all of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I want to preserve some stuff and I want uh, mom and dad on both sides to have access to that and kind of savor it a little bit more. Yeah. A thing that I found that I really value is voice recordings tucking my daughter in at night that's a big mm. one that's mm. a big one and so i'm thinking like what happens if i get old and i lose my eyesight or something like that it'd be really nice to hear that you huh. know i think it'd be cool i sing to my kids at night i think it'd be really cool to record that and just let them have a copy of that that's yeah. cool yeah i did a voice recording the other day um actually i think i sent it to you it's something i might listen to someday when i'm old and just in bed i want to remember just being in a big argument with a random guy 
and him yelling at me a lot. <laughs> that was funny. That was real funny. He was really mad. <laughs> he was very mad. I didn't do nothing to him. You did a great job. But I had the presence of mind to record it so you could be entertained. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Uh, thanks for helping me game it out, dude. And thanks for walking me through your system. I'm, I'm on the front end of this, but I feel like this whole process, work-wise and personal-wise, I, every time I take ground, I put an hour into it, a couple hours into it, I feel a little more ordered. Yeah. I don't know what that means psychologically. I don't think I said it very well, but I like the way it feels to start pulling this together. Instead of every day that goes by, it becomes more chaotic. That feels bad. This thing I'm trying to do now, even though it's obviously very imperfect, feels good. Like toward an ordered life, toward an ordered mind, toward an ordered story. Fighting entropy. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thanks for indulging me on this. It was genuinely helpful. I wanted your help on it and you've helped me on it. I appreciate it. Thanks, dude. I enjoyed thinking about it. I haven't thought about it in a long time. Cool.